Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Lord Jesus, you are the living light who transformed darkness into light. Through the blessings of this glorious Sunday, make us worthy to praise you with all those who saw the radiant light of your resurrection. We worship and we thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with the church and her children. Raise glory, honor, and praise to the living one who by his death gave life to his creation. By his resurrection he saved his church, gave joy to his flock, brought us back to his Father, and enriched us with the gifts of his Spirit. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. Holy begotten Son, you were born of the Father before all ages, and by your creative will you separated light from darkness on this, the first day of the week. You fashioned all creation to honor Adam, the image of your majesty. We praise and we thank you and we celebrate proclaiming, Blessed are you, for you appeared in the flesh on earth like us, and you lived among us. Blessed are you, for you were buried and counted among the dead and you shined your light in the sadness of the tomb. Blessed are you, for you rose to life, giving good hope to all, and you filled the angels with radiance, for when they appeared at your tomb like flashes of lightning. Now, O Christ, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense, to make us worthy to rejoice in the glory of your radiant resurrection. Breathe life into our departed and make them worthy to stand at your right hand in your eternal light that you have prepared for those who love you. With them we raise praise and thank you for your graces, and we glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit forever.
accept the fragrance of our incense and our prayers. And may we become a sweet fragrance through our good works and actions. Hear our petitions and grant rest to our departed in your dwelling place of joy. O Lord, our God, to you be glory forever. Kodishan Tarloho Kodishan Hayato no Kodishan Lomo Yuto with joy from the mountains. Sunday is a fee so great. Offer praise to the Lord God and with angels celebrate. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. I could not speak with you as with spirituals, but as fleshly people, as mere infants in Christ. I fed you milk and not solid food because you were unable to receive it. Indeed, you are still not able, even now, for you are still in the flesh. While there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not in the flesh? and behaving in an ordinary human way. Whenever someone says, I am of Paul, or another, I belong to Apollos, are you not being merely human? What is Apollos after all? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you became believers just as the Lord assigned each one. I planted, Apollo, Apollos watered, but it is God who caused the growth. Therefore, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who causes the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters are equal, and each one shall receive wages in proportion to his labor. 
For we are God's fellow co excuse me. For we are God's fellow co-workers, and you are God's cultivation, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a wise builder, I laid a foundation. And another builds now upon it. But each one must be careful how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one that is there, namely, Jesus Christ. Praise be to God always. Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Luke, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The evangelist Luke writes, and afterward, Jesus journeyed from one town and village to another, preaching and proclaiming the good tidings of the kingdom of God. Accompanying him were the twelve, and some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called the Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Husa, Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. When a large crowd had gathered, with many people from one town after another journeying to him, he spoke in a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he, as he sowed, some seed fell on the path and was trampled under. And the birds of the sky ate it up. Some seed fell on rocky ground. And when it grew, it withered because it lacked moisture. Some seeds fell among the thorns. And the thorns grew up along with it and they choked it. And some seed fell on good soil, and when it grew, it produced fruit a hundredfold. And after saying this, he cried out, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Then his disciples asked him what the meaning of this parable might be. And he answered, Knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God have been given to you. But to the rest, these are made known through parables, so that they may look but not see, and hear but not understand. 
This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. And those on the path are the ones who have heard. But the devil comes and takes away the word from their, out of their hearts, that they may not believe and be saved. And that which fell on rocky ground are the ones who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, but they have no root. They believe only for a time and fall away in a time of trial. As for the seed that fell among the thorns, these are they who have heard, but as they go along, they are suffocated by the anxieties and riches and pleasures of this life. And these fail to produce mature fruit. But as for the seed that fell upon the rich soil, these are they who, when they have heard the word, embrace it with a generous and luminous heart, and they bear fruit through perseverance. This is the truth, peace be with you. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid, namely Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You know that when they do studies with the children in the schools, and you divide up a classroom and you give half of the class randomly a letter A, you will be team A. And the other half of the class, again, randomly, you tell them, well, you're in team B. Then you watch what the children do. And it inevitably comes the fact that all of a sudden team A is much better than team B, my team. And you watch how the children will act at recreation during their breaks and how they act in the classroom. And it's quite extraordinary to see how, because you've labeled the children, a or B, all of a sudden B's are bad, A's are bad, and they'll look for reasons to excuse to say why A is bad or B is bad. And of course, the foundation of the whole thing is completely random. This is how deep the wounds of original sin run, and how deeply we are by those wounds to be tribal. Always them and us, them and us, or me, and them. And I give this example because St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, as you know, Corinth as a parish had lots of problems. And it really is a gift that these are all written down because their problems are no different than any other parish. And how we react to them becomes a different question. This is why St. Paul, when he writes, this is chapter three at the first Corinthians, when he writes to the Corinthians, he says, you are not yet spiritual enough. Now, spiritual is not in the modern goofy sense where you say I'm spiritual but not religious, which is stupid, because it basically means, well, I feel nice and warm and tingly on occasions and so that I'm spiritual. I can look at God's creation and be moved by a sunset so that makes me spiritual. Doesn't do any other thing of the sort. It just makes you appreciate the beauty of God's creation. St. Paul says that when I first came to you, you were not spiritual. He uses the term in these first lines, the word carnal, fleshly. And he says, when I first came to you, because always remember that St. Paul is the one who established the, the parish, the church at Corinth. 
And he says to them, when I first came to you, you were fleshly, you were carnal, you were people of this world. And remembering that when St. Paul uses the term fleshly, of the flesh, it means just this world, your worldly, you were worldly. Your motivations, your intentions, they were all this world. But he says, so I gave you only milk. I gave you simple things to understand. God has appeared to us in Jesus Christ. God died upon the cross at Calvary for your redemption. God rose from the dead. I gave you the simplest outline for you to understand because you were infants and unable to understand anything more profound. But he uses the term fleshly again. And while the first time is not pejorative, the second time is. Because he says, as long as you live in this manner, are you not only acting in a human way? Are you not simply being fleshly, carnal? And after this time that the church has been established, he's disappointed. So the second time he says to them about being fleshly, it is meant to be a rebuke. In his letter to the Hebrews, he will talk about fleshly and spiritual again. And saying to the Hebrews, you've not yet achieved that spirituality which you should have. In other words, maturity in grace, if you want a different term. You can drop the word spiritual and say, you've not matured in grace, you have not grown up, you are still children. In fact, we could even ask the question of many Catholics, if you quiz them on the catechism that they learned when they were 12, how much could they even answer these days? You recall, you were forced to memorize the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Could you name all seven now? And St. Paul says this is not good. This maturing and this deepening of the knowledge of the profound depths of the teaching of God are meant to progress, they are meant to grow. We are not meant to become stunted. And we will be stunted if all we do is remain at the very level that we were when we began. And so when you read this chapter three of the first letter to the Corinthians, what he's rebuking is the tribalism. What is church? When St. Paul talks about the spiritual people, he's talking about those who have allowed the grace to transform them and that their vision is transcendent. It's not team A and team B. It transcends this world. It is a world of the spirituals that is motivated by the kingdom of God. Not by a gain that I get from the kingdom, but by the beauty of the kingdom itself and the healing that it brings. So that when we speak about the spiritual, it's those who live by transcendent motives and principles. Doesn't mean that they're holy yet, but it means that the way that they think and that the way that they see the world and the way that they judge is radically different from everyone else in the world. And it doesn't matter what it is. It can be how you say the rosary. It could be, it can be economics, it can be politics. That's why it's always so sad to see Catholics degenerate either simply into progressive liberalism on one hand because they're conscious of social needs or to degenerate into neoconservative right-wing right stuff that the Protestants will think. But the Catholic Church has an entire vision of how human society is supposed to look. And how many of us have actually gone and bothered to see what the popes have taught over the last 150 years of revolution? It's very few. So we drop into team A and team B because it's quite natural to us. But St. Paul says it should not be this way. Last week when we considered church and we considered the doctrine of why the church teaches there's no salvation outside the church, because there's no salvation outside of Christ. Christ is God himself who entered into the world. He gave us the very path by which we are healed and find salvation. That vision is one that is continued here today in the letter to the Corinthians. 
So when we ask the question then what does it mean to be church? What does it mean to be the assembly of the body of Christ? It is always that aspect that we receive in order to give. As we've mentioned over these weeks, the church is always taught, the revelation of God makes it clear that we can see where the Spirit of God is working. It is the church, it is the divine mysteries. We can know with certainty of faith where God is working. The church does not teach that you can indicate where God is not working. But the revelation of God in the incarnation of Christ, the foundation of all things, that reality means that we know where the Spirit of God is actually laboring and working. When we go to confession, we know that God is here, absolving us, breaking the shackles of our sins, and bringing us the freedom. Kneeling next to my bed and praying, I don't know that. God may, God may not, which is why he instituted the mystery of penance. It is the way that we know that God is truly here. On the altar is the same thing, the presence of our Lord's death and his resurrection. This is my body, this is my blood. That is the foundation of the Eucharist. Communion flows from it. But the purpose for the divine mysteries of the Eucharist is that death and resurrection that we are allowed to participate in. And so the church has always taught that God has revealed himself so that there are places in time and in space that we know God is here and working. That is church. The desire to invite others into and to be open to others, to receive them, that is the very definition of the body of Christ. When an individual would, would do damage to themselves, and it is a tragedy to hear about all the children who continually wound themselves and do things in this world, things that I don't know about you, but I never heard of any other fellow student causing physical injury to themselves. There is something dramatically wrong with this world. But the opposite of it is the healing that takes place. The ability to be introduced and to be brought in to find that healing. It is not team A and team B. It is a world that is wounded and in despair and in darkness. And there is the body of Christ. If you divide anything, that is the division of the world. Christ and the wounded fallen world. But it means that those who are in Christ invite and to bring into this locus, to this place where the Spirit of God works, which is why the church is not just simply the only means of salvation and healing. It is one that is meant to be fruitful and productive. This echoes the question I asked probably a year or two ago in a sermon, when I said, who are the two people you have brought to the gospel? Who are the two people who have entered the church because you have witnessed to the healing value of grace? That is what St. Paul is rebuking when he writes, you are still carnal, you are still fleshly. And he says, can I not say this when you fight over, well, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. The parish itself is being broken up. I like Father Paul better. I like Father Apollo better. Apollo, well, he's much better. He's eloquent. He speaks beautifully. He has a good education from Alexandria. He's from Egypt. He's sophisticated. I'm of Father Apollo. Father Paul, oh, he's short, and he doesn't speak very well. That Apollo guy, oh, well, I figures. He was educated in the backwoods of Tarsus. We recognize that, which is why we can smile at it, because we recognize that's how human beings work. In fact, that is the whole social makeup of, of us culturally now, is it not? When people say, I found my tribe, this is my truth, none of those things mean anything. They are echoes of the wounds of original sin. And if they mean anything, they are indicative of a path of destruction. That when someone can stop and say, well, I found my tribe, what does this possibly mean? There are wounded human beings, and there are human beings who are on the path of salvation. That's it. Any other termination, 
That's why all of the aspects culturally of identity politics and everything else, this is a problem. Everything that breaks down the human race, other than the question of grace and woundedness, is from the devil. God's vision is one of bringing together all of humanity into the Christ. Which is why St. Paul goes on to say, to the Corinthians, you have to change your vision. This is the beginning of the first letter. He's trying to elevate their transcendent vision, or you can fix none of tribe A and tribe B. You can fix none of the tribalism if we don't actually start by the vision of what is the body of Christ. And so he says, when you go on about Apollos and Paul, he says, these men are one. They're merely human. And they're doing one thing. And then he says, well, yes, I, Paul, I laid the foundation. That's true. But that's no better. Apollo comes along and continues to build on it. He watered the field of cultivation. But both are one because it's God who gives the growth. This is why I've often said, and I'll repeat today, you will know if a parish is alive as a community by the number of converts you have each year. And I know throughout most of the years in many of the parishes I have worked, they have shown that vitality. And every Easter, there would be anywhere from one sometimes to 11 one year. And these are small communities. But they were communities that were vibrant, alive, and that is what St. Paul is pointing out. At Corinth, if you're going to argue over who likes Father Paul and who likes Father Apollos, uh, this is a disaster. Because you rend the very body of Christ and therefore you mutilate and suffocate the path of salvation. And that's why I said it's God who gives growth. You are God's field of cultivation, St. Paul says. What do I do? I plant seeds, that's it. But you are meant to be cultivating and to bring this ability. When we are convinced that the world is wounded or on the path of salvation, one of the two, there is no third option, then life becomes actually quite different. Because in the people that we see in their tribalism, we have compassion upon. And we come to understand the need that there is to assemble more and more individuals, not because we're tribe A, but because there's only one Christ. There's only one foundation of this reality. Which is why I began with that quotation that St. Paul says at the end of all of this, that no one, no one can lay any foundation other than the foundation which has already been established, which is Jesus Christ. St. Paul will say in another one of his letters, thanks be to God I didn't baptize any of you. Because if they're already going on about Father Paul and Father Apollos, then what they're showing is their fragmentedness. And he says, if I had baptized some of you, it'd be even worse. Because then you say, well, I definitely am part of Father Paul. And then he stomps himself in the letter and he says, oh, well, I forgot. Yeah, the family of so-and-so and the family of so-and-so. I did baptize those people. But other than that, the rest of the community not. So it is a Sunday that the church is asking us to look and to see what are we as the Catholic Church? What are we as an individual parish of Maronites in central Maine? And what is this vision on how we bring people in? Because if we don't do this, then we actually get dragged into that worldliness of being fleshly and carnal. That a Catholic who's not consciously living with the transcendent principles of their mind to working towards that healing of salvation is necessarily being pulled into the world. Which is why there are tens of millions of Catholics who are for all intents and purposes nothing different than pagans. They think like pagans, they judge like pagans, and they act like the world. And St. Paul says this should not be so. You are God's building. And the building means that it is continually being edified. We use this word edification. It's become a spiritual word. To edify someone means to help them on a spiritual path. These days, if we use the word ever anymore, but classically this word has always been there. But the word edify is actually from the Latin word, which means nothing other than to build. Our word edifice. Edificare just means to build something up. So to edify one another means to help each other grow into that temple of God. 
And so it, the church wants us to stop in these last weeks after the season of Pentecost and really ask what is our vocation as Christians? What is our calling as Catholics and as Maronites? That we are meant to bring other people to heal them. There's no them in us. There's no them versus us. There is no tribe A and tribe B. There is wounded humanity and there is the body of Christ. Those are the only two realities in this world. It has always been so since the time of our Lord and it shall be this way until judgment day. May God give us zeal and a profound sense of that unity and a profound desire to become ever more among the spirituals as our faith and grace matures within our lives. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Almighty Lord in God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the blessed mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the chosen one, our holy father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Augustine, and Saint Moses, the Ethiopian. Remember, O oh God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Continue with the anaphora of St. Mark the Evangelist on page 835. 835. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, Almighty Father, you are true and holy love. May we be bound by your divine love and find joy in it all the days of our lives. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with a holy kiss, that through Jesus Christ our Lord we may be your radiant and blameless flock. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God.
for you and us that you grant us in your mercy the riches of your grace and kindness. May your compassion and assistance sustain us all the days of our lives through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Father, you sent your only Son to save us, for we are weak and poor. When we had gone astray, he brought us back to your spiritual fold by his royal blood. Through your grace and the favor of your only Son, we implore you to accept this bloodless sacrifice from our sinful hands and through it to forgive our sins. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. Truly glory, thanks, praise, and honor are yours, O God, the Father, maker of all creation. With your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit, the angels, archangels, and all the heavenly hosts bless and praise you. They cry out and they proclaim. Whenever you have 
observe these commandments, you proclaim my death and resurrection until I come again. Jesus Christ, we remember your plan of salvation for us, your conception, birth, and baptism, your saving passion, and life-giving death, your burial, your glorious resurrection, and ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your royal second coming when you will judge all people and reward them according to their deeds. Now we ask you, at that fearful hour, have compassion on us and have mercy on us in your kindness and forgive our sins in your mercy. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, we your sinful children receive your graces we thank you for them and because of them may he perfect us as well the abundance of your grace and make us chosen vessels worthy of your service. Manin Mario, Manin Mario, Manin Mario, Nite Mordor of Ohio, Kodisho, Unachen the Lainu Alukurbono, oh no. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the pardon of faults, the honor of building and strengthening of your holy church and the protection of her children from all sin and may these holy mysteries allow us to stand with confidence before your awesome throne that we may raise glory to you to your only son and to your holy spirit now and forever Exalt your holy church established throughout the world. Protect her shepherds of the true faith in peace and security all the days of their lives. Especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, and Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops, pious priests, pure deacons, and all who serve your holy altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, all those who call upon your holy name. Bless those who are near and bring back those who are far. Visit the sick and strengthen the weak. Release captives and assist the oppressed. Bring back those who have strayed that they may live in your fear and reward those who have brought offerings to your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, all those who call upon your holy name. Bless those who are near and bring back those who are far. Visit the sick and strengthen the weak. Release captives and assist the oppressed. Excuse me. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders and all the children of your holy church. 
grant them security and peace, and keep domestic and foreign conflicts far from them, so that they may live in tranquility. Protect them by the sign of your living and victorious cross. Rescue the persecuted and the displaced of your flock, and be a refuge for strangers and a companion to travelers. Grant your eternal reward to monks, to those who live solitary lives, and to hermits who live on mountaintops and in caves of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, upon this altar and upon your heavenly altar, the holy and ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and evangelists, John the Baptist, the forerunner, Stephen the archdeacon and first martyr, Saint Joseph, Saint Jude, Saint Moses the Ethiopian, and all the saints. May we join their ranks and share in their joyful feast. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the faithful teachers who have gone to their rest in the true faith, especially Peter and Paul, Mark, Clement, Ignatius, Dionysius, Julius, and all those who endured suffering and persecution for the strengthening of your holy church. Remember also those who serve your holy altar and forgive their sins, that they may reach your joyful dwellings. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, all those who have left this world and have gone to you. Lead them to your joyful dwellings and blot out all their sins. To our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is with us in, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. But the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. and you are compassionate. You have sanctified this divine service and have perfected it in your good pleasure by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us now that we may be renewed as your spiritual children so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you, O glorious Father and lover of all people, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the Lord. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation of soul and body, and crush our enemy, the evil one. Grant us your mercy through Christ Jesus our Lord, for you are blessed and glorified with him and with your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo Elokulchunna. O Lord, look upon us, your inheritance, who bow before you, and guide our steps on your right path. Make us worthy to share in this sacrifice and may it sanctify the souls and bodies of those who receive it through Christ Jesus our Lord. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. <clears throat> holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth. To Him be the glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by Your holy body, and our souls purified by Your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
God the Father, how can we who are unworthy thank you for your grace? For you have given us this divine gift and have made us worthy of the share, to share in the body and blood of your only begotten Son who saved us. Through him and with him, glory and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo el Kurkunda. Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, you are worshipped and you are holy. Bless and forgive the priests who are the stewards of your people and of your holy church. Forgive the servers of your divine mysteries and all the faithful departed, who have, all the faithful who have shared in this sacrifice. Care for orphans, help widows, assist the poor and the distressed, and satisfy the hungry. And protect all who call upon your holy name in every place. May your name be glorified with that of your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you, now and forever. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.